Man, I'm glad you guys are here. You know, there's, there's so many voices in our, in our lives and, and what we have to deal with. And, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody just recently, and they might be in the room, so I'm not going to make eye contact. I, it slips from my mind who I was talking to. But they were, they were talking with, about the Old Testament, and, and they were referring to some things, and it was, it was just really interesting. And how um, and it, it, the, the conversation went to kind of how when things were evil in the Old Testament, and they were, they were talking, and I said, you, you understand, beyond the serpent in the garden, there's no revelation of the devil in the Old Testament. There's none. So, so in the Old Testament, that's why there, it gets confusing because people are asking, is that the same God in the Old Testament as the New Testament? It's like, absolutely. All right. But people that recorded the Old Testament, people had no revelation of the devil. So anything that happened, it was God. So if someone got sick or a plague came through or a storm hit or, or, or something, an enemy army or whatever, it was just God. And there's still a lot of church people that are like that. See, and we have to have a revelation uh, that we have an enemy and there's a devil because the, the bottom line with our lives, and I'm telling you, I'm going to preach this um, and, and drive the point home, and I believe driving the point home preaching works. But it, the, what, what we're looking, the, the outlook of my life, of our lives, of this church for this year is revival, deliverance, and abundance. And this Sunday, I'm going to talk about abundance, okay? We talked about revival. We talked about deliverance. We're talking about abundance Sunday. And then the next week, it's gonna, we're, gonna, we're just going to reboot it. It's going to be revival, deliverance, abundance. So it's six weeks of it to drive it home. And, but the point is, we got to remember, there's voices in our lives. And there's, 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 there's things in our life that speak to us. And you've got to be careful about what speaks to you. Man, you let God's word speak to you. You understand God's word speaks so much so it's so real to people that they'll say, well, the Bible says, and people are thinking, wait a second, the Bible's a book. That's before even audio books. Now I guess it can because, you know, you can, you can hit an app on your phone and the Bible will speak. But, but that book speaks because the word's alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The Holy Spirit speaks. Man, he, he's, he's a person. He has a personality. He has a presence. He has a power. The Holy Spirit speaks in our life, and we have to let the Holy Spirit, our own hearts speak. That's why you've got to fill your heart with good things. You've got to fill your heart with joy. You have to fill your heart with gladness. You have to, have to fill your heart with forgiveness. Why? Because your heart's going to speak to you. Man, if you've got bitterness in your heart, that's going to speak in your life, and everything in your life is going to be layered from a voice of bitterness. Does that make sense? See, and there, there's so many the people around you. There's people that, that, that the reason we have, one of the main reasons we have church, one of the main reasons is so that we can have godly voices in our life. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the preacher or the set man or, 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 or the worship leader or whomever. Man, in, in this room, there are, there, there are probably a hundred leaders in this room that, that understand the culture that are just absolutely, absolutely baptized in the doctrine of victory, of, of winning, that God's a good God and the devil's a bad devil and every good and perfect thing comes from above and you can trust God, you can trust God's word. Man, there's trustworthy people I'm in covenant with in this room. That, and really, honestly, a prerequisite that for me entering to covenant with somebody is that they're gonna give good godly counsel to people. Why? Because we're on a mission. And you know what I want to do? I want people around me that are going to push that mission. You know what our mission is? To help you win. Whatever you're going through. It's not vague at all. To some of you guys, it might be your marriage. To others of you, it might be your other relationships. To others of you, it might be your kids. Some of you guys, your health. Some of you guys, your money. Whatever, your vocation, whatever it is. Man, I'm telling you, there's enough spiritual horsepower. There's enough, the dynamics of this room is everybody in here. There's enough for, for us to help everybody to help them win. That's the mission of this church. And you'll, you'll say, well, Sheer, what do you want me to do? I want you to push the mission. That's what I want everybody to do. I want you to push the mission. Man, get godly people 
around you in your life that are pushing that. See, I believe the purpose, there's, there's one singular purpose for all of our lives. It's displayed in, in different facets. That It's like, a, it's, it's like a, a prism. When light hits a prism, man, rays of light and colors go from every, to every angle. And we all, we all are refractions of that. We all, we all reflect a, a piece of God that nobody else can. I'm, I'm, I'm showing a, a, a part of God that, that nobody on the planet can. See, there's people who say, well, if you don't do what, if Rob Fouch doesn't do what God's called him to do, man, God's going to have to find somebody else. I've never met another man like Rob Fouch. He is it. See that expression, when they made you, they broke the mold. Yes. Because we're fearfully and carefully and uniquely made. Man, God birthed us. God breathed in all of us. And you know what? Man, and what God's done is he's graced all of us. Man, there's things in my life that, that people will say, man, you need to get involved in this. I mean, man, I, 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 love the, I love the thought of it. I love the vision of it. But you know what? God hadn't graced me for that. The things I've gotten involved with in my life that I regret getting involved with, it's just because God didn't grace me for that. See, in my life, let me tell you, I don't know, maybe you it's different. It's not. I'm just trying to make a point. But God hadn't graced us to sin. God hasn't graced us to disobedience to his word. God hasn't graced us to go off on our own and, and, and not be connected with a local group of people. God hasn't graced anybody for that. See, you have to understand that there's a grace that's on all of our lives. And let me tell you, it's the same grace, but it comes through us differently. Man, God's, God's graced so many people in here to reach the Hispanic community. Man, people, God, God's graced some of you guys to be in law enforcement. God's graced some of you guys to be in the military. God's graced some of you guys to be in business. God's graced some of you guys to sing, to lead worship. And see, for, for me, there's things that I have to do that that, that grace isn't, isn't, isn't on my life in that area. I've got to make my, I still have to, to make myself do it. Like some of you guys grew up and you're avid readers. My daughter Kennedy, like Taylor was wondering where she came from because every day she was real little. She's, what, what's Kennedy doing? Oh, she's up in her room reading. I'd go up there and she's reading. And the book's like this thick. I'm like, you're eight. Who are you? My goodness, I mean, and the, the, the idea of this is, when I was a kid, I read one book as a kid before I got into high school. It was the Richie Asperger story. He was the second baseman for the Philadelphia Phillies back in the 60s. One book. And Kenny read, read like three or four books a week. And God's graced her. So you know what? She's reading the Word. I remember when I became a Christian, I gave my life to the Lord, that, that it, it, became, it became difficult. I'm like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to keep up? I'm not a reader. But you know what? So when that's the case, you've got to force yourself. You've got to make yourself. Man, when the music starts and you're finishing a cup of coffee out in the lobby, you know what? You make yourself come in and worship. But see, see with this, and I'm looking over at Nikki. Nikki doesn't have to make herself come in here and worship God. Man, they hit that first new note. They hit that that first bar hits. That first that force that 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 first vocal comes in. Man, let me tell you, she's in here. Her hands are up, and man, she's she's like this. It's a it's a workout, and she's grace for it. But let me tell you, there's things in her life she's got to make herself do. There's things in, in in all of our lives, man. That that to to help people win, we have to put a value. Can can I be honest with you? for a second. Can I wax like heathen honesty here? You have to celebrate and value everything that the church does and is. Everything. Well, I don't know that we should be giving groceries to everybody because all those people are poor people. Some of those people are just lazy. It's like, who are you? People ask me that. And you know, the first 10 times, if you were in the first 10, you get a pass. But that 11th person that asked me, I'm asking them, who do you think you are? I don't like you. You got an attitude that does not fit this culture. Because it, 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 listen, we're just giving groceries out. And you might say, why? Because our gift will make a place for us. And we get a place with people. Guess what? Jesus is going to be glorified. God's going to be honored. Does that make sense? See, that's what this is all about. That's what this whole thing's about. We want to help people win. 
But you got to be careful. You know what? Your circumstances have a voice. Do you know that? Some of your circumstances where you're like, oh, you're, 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 you're cursing the devil when it's God who shut the door. I'm not talking about his provision. I'm not talking about healing. I'm not talking about, about, about take, uh, take care of all your need according to the riches of glory. I'm talking about the wants and the desires and the things in your life that you're thinking, this ought to happen for me right here and right now. And guess what, God? I guarantee you, if you say, if you, if you got to tap God on the shoulder and him, him say, yes, what do you need? God, are you tired of the entitlement in the church? You know what he would say? I'm up to here with it. See, and we look at it, let me just tell you, I, one thing I know, the world doesn't stop spinning because you came up to a, a closed door. The Bible says this, any door God opens, no man can close. Any door God closes, no man can open. And because I think that I ought to have my way and that door's not open, it's like, wait a second, I gotta check myself. Because let me tell you, those doors have voices. And we've got, to, we've got to remember that. We've got to understand that. And the last one that I want, this, I'm not preaching yet. So don't start that clock yet. Dadgummit. They started already. I should have told them sooner. But the last one is your faith has a voice. You know, I sent a text. Somebody, can, can I have my phone? I sent a text. I, 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 there's people that, that, that this, they, they, had a, they, have a, they have a kid who, they were believing God uh, that got sick. I think got cancer or something. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to, you guys will figure out who it is. I don't know what this phone's doing. So it's like this, the, these symptoms came back and it very well could be the worst case scenario. And we just wanted to let you know so you could pray and just hear from heaven. And, and it struck a chord in me. I get calls like that all the time. I get texts like that, okay? And here's my response. James 1.6 tells us to ask in faith without doubt, not letting the circumstances move us off that stand of faith this new development doesn't change our stand of faith. Everybody in here is still in agreement, right? It's no secret that the devil will try to knock you back from your stance of faith when you're facing a difficult challenge. However, in this pivotal moment when he is pushing his hardest, you must be aware that you stand at a crossroads. You have a crucial choice to make. You can give up or you can stand your ground and boldly declare, I refuse to be moved off my position of faith. The word of God is true and I'm not gonna back off. And then I, and then I typed something and it caught me because I've never thought about this before. I was, I was kind of ranting in a, in a text. I, I don't know if you guys know, but I, I'm prone to rant sometimes. And, and but, but, but the next thing, the next thing shocked me. And, I, and I'm the one who texted it. It's, and it, it. it says, faith knows what it wants. And I don't know that I've ever really thought about it in those terms before. But you know what? Your doubt knows what it wants. Your unbelief knows what it wants. Your faith knows what it wants. It doesn't vacillate. It never moves. Faith stands still in one spot. So make your bold confession of faith. God, I believe this person's name is healed in Jesus' name. This is your will for her life, and I'm not moving until I receive the fulfillment of it. I'm immovable standing on your healing provision. I will not be moved. Keep your head up, your eye on the prize. Don't allow anxiety to take root in your heart. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we could ask or think. But let me tell you, your faith there's, has a desire attached to it. Your faith knows what it wants, and your faith has to begin to speak for you. See, see, God's word has to speak. The Holy Spirit has to speak. Godly people in your life have to speak. The doors God opens or closes have to speak, and your faith has to speak. That's what you trust. So go back through the archives and listen to it again so you can write it down, and those can be boxes that you can check. 
You can check those boxes. Does God's word say this? Has the Holy Spirit delivered this in my life? Is, my, is that where my heart is? It, is there a door open for me or a door closed for me? And is, has my faith spoken? That's when you start moving. That's when you start jumping. See, so what we have to understand is we've got five things we have to do. Number one, write this down. We have to lay down our lives. We're Christians. It's like, hey, I got good news for you. You get to lay your life down. That's the only way you get God's life. See, if you, sir, if you think, well, I give, I'll give you God, I'll give you 50. I'm going to start off. Let's, let's just negotiate a little bit, God. I'll give you 50% of my life. God's not giving you any of his. God's giving you his when you give him yours. You have to lay it on your life. Number two, you have to become a living sacrifice. So you know what? The music starts, you get in here, period. I don't care if it's rude, if somebody's, somebody's pouring their heart out, they're in the middle of a sentence, you say, hey, I got to run, the music started, I got to make myself, so hold that point, I'll talk to you after church. Number two, you're living sacrifice. Number three, this is the big one, trust God's word. You have to trust God's word. You have to put all your trust in God's word. You have to trust God's word more than I trust this, this stage. You have to trust that I can stand on it. You have to trust God's word more than, you, you, than, than that chair you're sitting in. Were you concerned about that chair giving in when you sat down on it? No, you just, you just plopped down. It's comfy, right? We're not making people sit on a nail here. Man, we're giving you a cushioned seat. It's all comfortable. But you know what? It's a chair you can trust. The Word of God, we can trust it. Number four, we have to allow, we have to allow God to renew our minds. This one's huge. Because you've, al you've always thought a certain way. There's always been a certain angle. There's always been a certain direction. There's always been a certain layer. There's always been a certain scent. There's always been a certain cover. There's always been something on how you think. And you have to allow God, God to renew your minds. And number five, you've got to live connected to his body. And that's the one, I'm not sure that's very popular or trendy these days. I don't know anymore. I just know for me, it's a staple I get off of my own, stick a fork in me. Because the Bible's clear, the, a fool's right in his own eyes. So often I think I'm right. It's like, hey, how about this? Well, let's rethink that. See, we have to understand this. And see, so, so getting in this, I want to lay some groundwork for Sunday. Can I do that? That's what I'm doing on Wednesday nights now. I'm going to lay a groundwork for Sunday. So on Sunday, I'm going to talk about abundance. Is there anybody in here that has a problem with abundance? No, for real. If you do, I want to, I want to, I want to meet you. Because I, I asked this Jesuit priest one time. I was on TBN 25 years ago. And, and this Jesuit priest, that his, his congregation was across the, is it Juarez? It's across the border from El Paso. Okay, well, he, his church was in Juarez, and he's this, he, he's, he's a white guy, and he, it, it, it was interesting because he had his, his priest deal on with his collar, but he had black high-top Chuck Taylors, and so he was on after I was on, and everybody's in the back talking and stuff, and I'm mesmerized with this guy because those Jesuit priests are smart guys, so we go to dinner afterwards, and we go to the, we're in Dallas, we go to this high level steak place and he's eating and he said, you understand? He said, I could, I could, the budget of my church could be met with the six meals that are getting served right here at this dinner. And I, you know, it's, we, we just started the church and, and uh, I still had long hair at the time. And, and so I was kind of a novelty and he's a novelty and we're sitting together at dinner and, and I was talking to him and he said, and he was asking me about guts and how, how he'd love to visit and how it sounded intriguing to him and the, the whole thing. He said, I never heard anybody that could call church God. I said, he said, is there anything you want to ask me? And it's funny because there was something. I said, tell me about those vows. You know, because priests take vows. Do you guys know, any Catholics in here? What, used to be Catholics? Shoot. Well, there's vows. Priests take vows. I, I assume nuns do too. Would you assume that? 
What's good for the goose is good for the gander, okay? So, so, so they take vows, and it's a vow of poverty, it's a vow of chastity, it's a vow of rooting for the cubs, it's a vow of whatever it is, okay? There, but there's like four or five of them. And I said, tell me about these vows. He said, what do you want to know? I said, I can't find them in the Word. He said, I can't either. I'm like, hold it. You made a vow. You committed your life to them. He said, yeah, st stop overthinking it. It just keeps me safe. I'm like, okay, good enough. I appreciated it, but it's not something I'm going <laughs> to trans I'm gonna try to translate or transfer to other folk. See, we've got we've to be in this place where, where right now in our lives, the connectivity of this church is pivotal. It is. Because there, with everybody, there is, have, has been injections of fear into people's, into people's lives. And some of you guys have, you, you got the antibodies for it. It, it. It's not affecting. Others of you, it's like, ah, uh, but how much of it's real? And, I mean, I want to use common sense and, and, it's, and other, other, other things come into play. But listen, I get it with, regarding the pandemic. I do, I get it. But, I, but then if that seeps into others of your life and how you think, because that's what happens. It gets in your circulation, and then next thing you know, it's in your blood, and it's in your DNA, and it, and it, it exposes you to things, and, and you become intolerant of some things, intolerant of other things, and we have to be careful about fear. We can't play with it, okay? You don't have to, you don't have to like the virus. You just can't fear it. I'm just telling you, okay? Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter 5.8. Peter writes, and this, this, this letter, let me explain something to you. And, and you wouldn't necessarily think this about Peter, but it's a pastoral letter. He's pastoring people writing this letter, okay? And it starts off with verse 8. He said, be sober. Be vigilant. So he's saying, look, be alert. See, you have to understand, Jesus started talking about the devil, and he was the first one for thousands of years. They're like, oh my gosh, we have an adversary. Okay, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Listen, that term devil is not as much a name as it is a modus operandi, as it is a job description. It's the penetrator of your soul. And he's going to vehemently strike you to try to penetrate how you think. Okay, that's what devil really means in the Greek. All right, so he said be, the, the, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. See, what, what, that, what that is, more than like a devil, think about this as a prosecutor. Think about this as someone that's trying to litigate against you or trying to build a case against you. The devil's looking for leverage in your life like a prosecutor would, where he's, he's pushing those buttons, trying to get you to make a deal, trying to get you to, to lower your sentence a little bit, trying to get you to, man, so, so he's going to. That's why it's imperative for all of us to have a revelation of God's consuming forgiveness from our past. See, if your past is still haunting you, the devil's got a play in all your life. There's a leash on your life if the devil has any kind of play in your past. See, we all have a past. We all have things we regret. Some of them are distant past. Some of them are recent past. None of it matters. It's all your past. I'm telling you, all God cares about is where you are and where you're going. See, the, whole, the Bible says the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of everything Jesus said, which is the hope of the gospel, and, and, and show you things you didn't know. And lead, listen, listen, listen. And lead and guide you in all truth. See, lead and guide means like if, if, you, put a, if you put a lead on a, on a horse or you put a lead on a cow, where you just take that cow and you're walking that cow. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. But what we have to do is we have to submit ourselves like that cow or that horse would have to. Because you know what? That cow or that horse is much more powerful than anybody in here. So you take that lead and you're just walking that horse along or you're walking that cow along. They outweigh you. They're stronger than you. But let me tell you, they'll, they'll submit to you. 
And that's what we have to do with the Holy Spirit. See, in verse 9 then, it says, resist him. So we've got to resist the devil. So you, so you ask yourself, how? He's the devil. He's the Antichrist. Here's how we resist him. We're steadfast and movable in faith. It's like that text I just read. It's like, look, I am, I've taken a stand of faith. I'm not budging. I'm not moving. I'm not, I'm not negotiating. I'm not compromising. I'm not caving. I'm not going to flinch. I'm not going to cower. I'm not moving a bit. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what they say about the disease. It doesn't matter what that diagnosis is. I'm telling you right now, I am not budging. That baby, that, that, that kid is, gonna, is, it, it, is healed and will fulfill God's purpose on this earth. Anybody with me on that? See, resist him. Steadfast of faith. Now listen, listen, please. Knowing that the suffering, the sufferings are experienced by your brethren all over the world. Those sufferings are not, now listen, they are not infirmities. It's not like the virus. It's not like the flu. It's not like cancer. It's not, it's not, it's, it, 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 it's not, um, it, it's not debt. It's not, it's not divorce. It's not what the sufferings are are the sufferings of Christ. It's persecution. See, what we don't talk about much is the church, Christians, are built for persecution. We're built for adversity. We're built for, we're built for the battle. See, everything in the word, the, the three analogies that are always made consistently, agriculture, athletics, and warfare, military. That's what it is. So at verse 10, Peter writes, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after he had suffered, okay, the sufferings of Christ, the persecution. Oh, you call yourself a Christian. Man, save yourself. What do you think, you're better than me? It's all that stuff. It's a mental game that the devil uses people to play against you. After you've suffered a while, listen, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's what that persecution, that's why we can't cower. That's why we can't flinch. That's why we can't turn from persecution. I'll tell you what, when we started, everyone, everyone loved it. I'm telling you, if a deacon in, in Tulsa County found a dime bag in his son's sock drawer, he brought him to guts. Man, I appreciate what you're doing for those people. Everybody loved it. We moved to this property on the expressway, everything flipped. Oh, you're that big church in the expressway. I was telling a, I was telling a group of people that, that I meet with on, at 5.30 on Wednesday nights, I was saying, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what to do. Because some people will say, man, I love guts because it's got a small field. And other people say, man, it's just too big. I can't plug it. I'm like, okay, we need a consensus where people make up their minds. But see, understand this, that what God wants to do and, and then he finishes it by, he says, to God be the glory and the dominion forever and ever, amen. So, so those four terms, think about this, the persecution of your life. See, because what the devil's gonna try to get you to do is cower, be worried about people finding out you're a Christian or, or finding, well, what do you think, you're perfect? No, but you giving me this rash of stuff is gonna perfect me. So lay it on me. See, that's why we, we're not looking for persecution, but we can't cower from it. I mean, this word has got to be razor sharp because the Bible says it's a two-edged sword. You don't want to go into battle with a, a dull sword. You don't want to chop down a tree with a dull ax. Man, you want, to, you, want to, you, want your, you want your sword, you want your ax to be as sharp as they could be. Why? Because... That persecution, that persecution is going to perfect you. The, that persecution is going to establish you. See, some of you guys, listen, you've been a Christian for a long time. Why aren't you promotable? Why This is getting in your kitchen a little bit, but, but why, why, why don't you feel valued like you should, but you've been a Christian for 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years? Man, I know a lot of people like that. They get sour about church. 
Man, there's people, there's people, what's interesting is there's people say, well, they're promoting all those young people. There's a, there's a youth movement in the church. They're just kind of the, leaving us out the pasture. That's the farthest thing from the truth. I'm 62 years old. I'm not heading to some pasture somewhere. Man, I, wanna, I, wanna, I still want to run to the battle. And see, we've got to understand that, that it's going to perfect you, it's, that that persecution is going to establish you. Man, people start laughing at you because you're a Christian. That strengthens you. And you know what it does? And this is the biggest thing. There's so many people that don't have this element in their Christian walk is they're settled. And I'm good with this. You know what that settling is? It's like concrete that, that what do you call that, Dylan? When the concrete sets up and it, it's hard and you can walk on it, you can drive on it, huh? It's cured. That's an interesting term. Okay, but that, that concrete's settled. Man, you know what? That concrete that's under your chair, it's settled. It's not going anywhere. See, we've got to understand that. Now we go to the, now we go to the, gosh darn, I got two minutes. Man, everybody sit up and pay attention. John 10.10, 10, okay? The, the, this is the will of the devil. The Bible says the thief doesn't come except to, to steal and to kill and to destroy or to, or to, to, to destroy. I've come to give you life and life more abundant. Okay, so we look at that. The will of the devil is to be a thief. It's not a common thief. That word there, this could be interesting, Scott. That word thief is, act, is actually a kleptomaniac. Anybody know what a kleptomaniac is? It's somebody that steals and can't help themselves. See, we take it so personally when we feel like the devil's attacked us. And you know what? He can't help himself. He's not attacking you. He's not stealing from you because you got something he wants. He's stealing from you because he's a kleptomaniac. Man, the, the word in the Greek is actually klepto something, where we get the word kleptomaniac. See, so the will of the devil is the thief, the kleptomaniac, doesn't come except to steal and to kill. That kill is not murder, but it's actually like a sacrifice, like a religious sacrifice. To, to, to give, the, you have, where he cons you into giving something up that's precious and dear to you. And then to destroy, that word destroy actually is, is, is to liquidate. So the thief doesn't come except, listen, except to steal and to get you to give away the precious things in your life and to liquidate all your assets. See, now it makes sense, right? Because why would a thief come to kill? See, so it's almost mistranslated. or it's, it's, it, 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 We have to go into some depth. That's why it's important to study the word. That's why when you look at it, you think, well, does this make sense? A thief killed, steal, destroy? No, it doesn't. But when you look at it, when he's there, that destroy is actually to liquidate your life. How many of you guys have ever had your lives liquidated? You just lost it all. Drugs may have done it. Poor decisions do it. See, all of that is the will of the devil. And the will of God then, Jesus said, I've come that you have life and have it more abundantly more abundantly. See, it, it, go, it takes us from the life of defense to the life of offense. Man, you guys, you guys are baseball players, right? What's the, what's the optimal amount of, of hitters to, to, to hit against you in an inning? What's the optimal amount? How many? Three. Three. If it's four, if it's five, if it's six, if it's eight, if they hit around the order, that's a bad inning, right? Well, you know what? What the devil wants to do is to keep you on defense. And what God wants to do is put you on the offense. Man, you make, you make a diving catch or something on the third out, everybody on the field sprinting into the dugout, and everybody's celebrating, and everybody's congratulating. And now the momentum's turned, and now the next guy that comes up there, he's like, let me tell you something. I'm going to own you. I don't care what you're throwing. I'm going to hit it back up through your teeth. See, that's the attitude we have to take, a life of defense versus a life of offense. You know why? Because God's given us, he said, Jesus, listen to this, Hunter, life more abundantly. That, that abundantly actually, actually means excessively. 
See, see, too many, too many people are raised in church, and some of you guys are there. You were raised in church where it's like, well, you don't have too much. God won't give you too much. It's like bull baloney. All God does is give us too much. He's a God of more than enough. He's a God of excess. Understand that. So it's abundantly, it's exceedingly, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. I don't want to live an ordinary life. I don't want to just, I don't want to just get into the game or get into the concert or get into church. I want the best dead gum seats. And you'll say, well, you really shouldn't. Really? I'm a child of God. I'm a child of the most high God. I'm a child of the king. They're not sitting me in the nosebleeds. See, that's favor. It's abounding in an extraordinary measure. See, some of you guys, 2020 is destined to be the greatest year of your life financially. But you look at it, you think, man, I've already lost two months. You think God cares about that? What do you think God's gonna be limited? Because, well, you lost two months, so you know what? It's all, you only got 10 months of work, so your income, no. It's, ex, it, it's exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or think. It, you know what that, the more abundantly really means? It's like a river that overflows its banks and it floods beyond its banks. It's overflowing, it's plentiful, it's super abundance. See, that's what I'm preaching Sunday. I'm not preaching a, a get by life of abundance. I'm preaching and embarrassing. I'm embarrassed how blessed I am. I want people pulling up to your house going, dear God, you live here? Who died? No, for real, that's a good question. Jesus did. That's how I live here. Because you know what the Bible says? The Bible says I'm a city on a hill that can't be hidden. You know what that really means? That really means God wants to show us off. He wants to show out through our lives. Man, can you explain this? Yeah, I'm a tither. I am. I'm not ashamed to tell you. Sandy and I, since we've been married, have, have never, there was one year at the end of the year, she realized she got the statement from the church we went to and, and we were a tithe short, so evidently we missed a tithe. Dear God, let me tell you something. The sun was not going to go down until I figured out how to get that check to that church. There was no internet there yet. So no, nope, no, nope. we screwed up bad. Why? Because the Bible says, God says, look, try me, prove me now in this, that I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great it's unable for you to receive it. You can't, you can't keep it. You got to get rid of it. You'll say, well, that sounds like Bill Gates kind of money. That sounds like Jeff Bezos kind of money. That sounds like Donald Trump kind of money. Yeah. Heck yeah. That's the kind of money we're talking about. And you'll say, well, it's all about the money. No, it's not. All that money is is provision. I'll tell you, all that money is in my life is seed. You're not going to have to ask somebody to help you put your kids through college. You're not going to have to ask a bank to give you a loan for that. What if the next house you bought, you paid cash? Let's start with the next vehicle you bought, you paid cash. What about the next set of clothes, suit of clothes you bought, you paid cash? That's a good day, huh? It's called legal tender. They have to take it. But you know what? Provision follows vision. When your vision becomes a vision of abundance, that's when you activate the Spirit of God. If you just want to get by, you're not going to activate God. You're not going to. God, please help me pay the rent. I'm telling you, if I were God, I'd be yawning. I'd be like, are you kidding me? Do you not listen to the Word? Do you not listen to the faith? Do you not have a voice? Does, does, does your faith not have a voice in your life? See, listen, I'm not trying to beat anybody down. I'm not, I'm not pointing at anybody. I'm just telling you, this message has to be driven home in our lives. And you know what? Otherwise, we got to repent. Repent. You know why? The kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's right here. It's here. The kingdom of heaven's here. It, does, it, does, it doesn't say... His kingdom or God's kingdom. It says the kingdom of heaven is here. 
Heaven, what are the, what are the, what are the roads and highways made of in heaven? What's this, is there a speed limit in heaven? No. There's no limit in heaven. That's a life that God's given us. I, mean, I hope it's going to be more fun Sunday. Doesn't feel like this was any fun for you. I did rant a little bit. Because this is, this is important to me. It's pulling people down. Too much of America's in debt. Too much of America is, is unemployed. Man, you're, you're listening to media reports that are saying so many jobs are not going to be there anymore after this quarantine. I don't care. I'm not here for a job anyway. I'm here for the work. That's why I'm here. God blesses the work of our hands. We're getting out of that clocking in and out job mentality. We've got to have a takeover mentality. Especially coming, coming out of this pandemic, you have a takeover mentality. Man, if you're looking for a promotion, start doing what that, that person above you is doing. But you got to get there a little earlier. You might stay up a little later. Might not get flex hours. Might not be able to work remotely. Let me tell you, people are going to see your good works. It's going to glorify God.